Hello and welcome to Beastophilosis, the hairy beast, where we talk about everything hairy and extinct. In this episode, I want you to do an experiment. Take some uh, Kleenex or toilet paper and stuff your ears. Plug up your ears so you can't hear. Then I want you to do is take your jaw and place it on a board like this. And I want you to take a stick or a spoon and pound on the uh, desk or whatever you have and listen. Then take your jaw off the table and listen. It'll seem a lot quieter than when you have your jaw on the table. Why is this? Why can you hear better through your jaw than you can in your ears when you have your ears plugged up? Well, it has to do with the way in which our hearing is uh, situated and how it's evolved through time. So sound can propagate in two ways. It can hit your eardrum and send messages through your middle ear into your cochlea, which is the inner ear, the fluid-filled part of your ear that then basically provides movement in the fluid and that gets transmitted to your brain. The other way is to do it directly through your jaw. So have the sounds move through your mandible, up through your jaw, up into your skull, and into your cochlea, where it will shake the liquid in your inner ear and send signals to your brain. Now early on, when mammals had just come out of the water and were early tetrapods, they couldn't hear in the new environment. And so the best way to hear was to take their lower jaws and place them on the ground. Now most of these creatures were sprawling creatures and they could listen by having their jaw against the ground and listen for animals that might be scurrying around, insects that might be food. Ah. But this isn't great. And so one of the big innovations that happened with many different pteropods, and this appears to have happened separately, was the development of an ear drum. Now the ear drum is a little bit different in that we have a flap of skin that's very, very thin. And underneath that, we have a bone that then directly contacts the inner ear, the fluid-filled part of the ear, which moves those fluids around, and that sends a signal back to the brain that there might be food or a predator about to eat you. Now, this is a Demetriodon, one of the big sailback mammal-like reptiles that crawled around during the Permian period, even before the age of dinosaurs, and they are distant, 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 distant relative. Now, Demetriodon had a early eardrum, and so it didn't have to have its jaw down against the ground to listen for food that it was going to eat. It was a predator, after all. So the condition looked something like this. This is a quick little schematic drawing of a jaw. This would be a, sort of what you might see in some of these early mammal-like reptiles. Here we have the lower jaw with some teeth there, beautifully illustrated, I must say. And then we have this red bone, that's the surangular. And then we have the quadrate, which is the blue bone. And the contact with the skull would be with the quadrate bone, the little bone at the back of the jaw. They would contact the upper part of the skull, this part up here. Now, early on, there became another bone. This is called the articular. So the articular was, as its name suggests, articulated with the upper part of the skull. And so there was the articulation of these jaw joints. There we had the eardrum around the surangular down there. Now, along came, during the Jurassic Age, during the age of the dinosaurs, a creature called Morganucodon. This was a little teeny mammal, not like the big, scary Dometrodon. This little creature had a jaw joint that was a little bit different. Instead of the articulation between the um, articular and quadrate, it had our articulation with the denary, so the lower jaw with the skull. And these two bones had become incorporated with the ectotympanic near the eardrum, 
as the malus and incus bones now. This is Morganucodon. He was such a cute little mammal. And anyway, so the articulation moved from the quadrate up to the denary. And the ectotympanic was completely separate, now with the eardrum. And the malus and incus bones went alongside with the stapes to form the middle ear, a zone of three little bones in the ear. Now, if we look at modern mammals, we have three tiny, teeny tiny, bones inside our ear, lying right underneath our eardrum, the tympanic membrane. And here, when sound then comes, it hits that tympanic membrane, and it passes through all three bones, the malus, the incus, and the stapes, to then push on the liquid part of the inner ear, sending signals to our brain that there is sound. Biologists, comparative biologists, have known about this for a long time, in part by studying the embryology, that is, the early development of early embryos, such as little mice embryos. Here is a little embryo of a day-old fetus of a dog. And what you'll note in the lower jaw here is that the bones that will eventually become part of the early ear bones, the middle ear bones, are associated with that jaw, in fact, kind of attached to them. But as the little embryo, the little fetus, gets older and older in the womb, the ectotympanic and these middle ear bones become separated away from the jaw. It isn't until quite late in development that this, in fact, happens. So when you call out to your little puppy, your puppy can hear you say, sit, boo-boo, sit. And so this is the remarkable pathway of a bunch of bones that are associated with the lower jaw, the serangular, the articular, the quadrate, becoming incorporated in the middle ear and being involved in hearing the ectotympanic, the malus, the incus. And the stapes, well, the stapes just stay the stapes. Thank you for watching this video, and take care till next time. So long.